Welcome to our special presentation today. And again, my name is Hal Grotevant, and I direct, direct the Rudd Adoption Research Program at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And our presentation today is sponsored by the Rudd Program and the Center for Research on Families at UMass, and by the Fulbright International Scholars Program. It's wonderful to see so many of you here today from many time zones and many countries. That is one of the advantages we have in this COVID world is that we are able to have a much greater reach and have a, a global community for talks like this, which is wonderful. So I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker, Anne-Marie Shire. I met Anne-Marie in 2018 at the International Conference on Adoption Research in Montreal. And then she joined us at UMass in May of 2019 for our Summer Adoption Research Institute. It's really been a pleasure getting to know her and becoming familiar with her fascinating research on a topic of great current interest. Anne-Marie is a doctoral candidate in social work at University College Cork in Ireland. And she's also a lecturer in social work at the Technological University Dublin. On her Fulbright, she's putting the finishing touches on her dissertation, which is called Intercountry Adoption Reunion in the Irish Context. But today's presentation focuses on one aspect of that dissertation, namely the use of social media and technology in establishing and maintaining relationships between internationally adopted young adults and their birth relatives in other countries. I know that you'll find it fascinating so please join me in welcoming Anne-Marie Shire, whose talk is entitled, Using Social Media and Technology and Adoption Search and Reunion, The Lived Experiences of Irish Intercountry Adoptees. Welcome, Anne-Marie. Thanks, Al. <laughs> So uh, thanks very much for that introduction, Hal. I hope um, you can see my screen. Amanda, can I just check with you that that's okay? Yeah, thank you. So as Hal mentioned, my name is Anne-Marie and um, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to present my research here today. Um, today's presentation is drawn from the preliminary findings from my doctoral study, which I've been working on during my time here at UMass. And before I begin, I suppose I want to thank you all for being here. Um, I'm both, um, you know, really pleased and absolutely terrified to see so many people have signed up uh, and shown an interest in the research. But, um, but it really is humbling. And I thank you for taking the time to, to listen. Um, I would like to just thank everyone at the Rudd um, Programme and at CRF for supporting this session and for the welcome they have given me while I've been here, especially to Amanda who's been doing all the background work to set this up today. And of course, Professor Hal Grodevant for his support and sponsorship of my time here. And thanks also to my advisors at home in Ireland, Dr. Alistair Christie, Dr. Simone McCochran, and Dr. Hilary Jenkinson, um, who've been supporting me remotely um, while I've been here and over the past number of years while I've been working on this, this um, research. And thanks also to Fulbright for the fantastic opportunity to spend the time here at the Rudd Adoption Research Programme and Technological University Dublin for their support. But of course, in any research of this nature, the main thanks has to go to the participants who have so generously shared their experience with me and whose voices are so central to this research. And I know that it's they, these voices that you will most enjoy hearing. At the outset, I think it's important to be clear about my own positionality and how I came to this research. So I am a non-adopted white Irish woman. Uh, my previous experience of adoption is in my role as an adoption social worker in Ireland. And this was specifically in the area of information and tracing in a domestic adoption context in Ireland. And it was this experience of working with adult adoptees and birth parents who were seeking birth information or contact with their birth families that drew me to this area of research with the hope of better understanding what this experience might be like in an international context. I'm here on an Irish US exchange, as Hal mentioned, and as a nod to that, I've decided to use some photos of Ireland to accompany my slides. 
So before I get into the findings and the research, I want to give a brief outline of intercountry adoption to Ireland for some of you who may not be as familiar with it. Um, so intercountry adoption to Ireland began in the early 90s with adoptions from Romania. And this really was a humanitarian response initially, um, but it was also influenced and corresponded with a decrease in the number of children who were being placed for domestic adoption in Ireland. The total population of Ireland is just over 5 million, to give some context, and between 1991 and 2020, there were 5,043 intercountry adoptions to Ireland. However, the vast majority of these, as you can hopefully see from the graph, um, over 4,000 occurred between 1991 and 2010, and the main countries that these were from were Russia, Romania, Vietnam, and China. So since a spike in, three, in, in 2008 of 397 adoptions to Ireland um, to just 21 in 2020, uh, intercountry adoption continues to account for the majority of our non-family adoption in Ireland, even though the numbers are very, very low. At the same time, the number of domestic adoptions in Ireland today is very small, with just five non-family domestic adoptions recorded in 2020 and six in 2019. So my research focuses on the lived experience of adult adoptees. And as we know, a lot of previous research has focused on outcomes for adoptees and particularly on adoptees as children. A lot of this research has also been from the perspective of adoption, adoptive parents. And adoption is sometimes seen as a childhood event. And my position and the position of this research is that adoption is a lifelong event. I hope that this research will in a small way build on the body of research which centers the adult adoptee's experience and focuses on the lived experience of adult adoptees. This focus was also evident at Rudd's recent online conference and also at ICAR during the summer and has been highlighted by Margaret Homans and other critical adoption scholars. I'm going to provide an overview of my methodology and I know some of this will, will maybe be quite familiar for some of you. Um, as I mentioned, the focus of this study is on the lived experience of people who are adopted. And qualitative methods are really the best way to access this type of information. Research which uses qualitative methods like interviews traditionally has a small number of participants, both probes in depth. That's the situation in this research. Unlike with quantitative methods, the purpose is not to generalize to a broader population, but rather to reveal and identify concepts and themes that aid in understanding the experience. I'm using an interpretivist approach, and this approach is concerned with research that explores the meaning of an experience from the perspective of those that experience it. It acknowledges that meaning is constructed, not discovered, so subjects construct their own meaning in different ways, even in relation to the same phenomenon. By using semi-structured, in-depth interviews with 12 participants, I had an opportunity to gain an insight and an understanding of the multiple and equally valid but often differing meanings of the reunion experience for adoptees. I used an interview guide and prompts rather than very specific questions and this allowed the participants to shape the interview and focus on the parts of their story which they felt were most important. The interviews were up to two hours long and in one case I did two interviews with one participant. This obviously left me with quite detailed and lengthy transcripts to transcribe and analyze. I used um, Braun and Clark's guidelines for thematic analysis, and this is a method of identifying, analyzing, and reporting of themes and patterns in qualitative data that involved really immersing myself in the data while I was doing the coding. My coding and analysis was inductive or bottom up, um, which means that my coding and themes were driven by my data. I also used in vivo to organize the data, which was very helpful as the trans transits were quite long and it can, can be unwieldy to manage in like a word program or something similar. And this has also been very helpful in providing an audit trail in terms of my process. So the sample of 12 are adult adoptees who were adopted internationally to Ireland from six countries, Vietnam, Romania, Belarus, Russia, Colombia and Guatemala. Sampling was challenging, and as intercountry adoption to Ireland just started in 1991, the potential number of people over 18 who have searched for their birth family may be very small. As I mentioned, I also came to the study as an outsider researcher, 
which may also have added to their recruitment challenges. I used purposive, opportunistic and snowball sampling in my recruitment. So while the term international adoption is used interchangeably with intercountry adoption, in Ireland, the term intercountry adoption is what is most frequently used. And that's the term I'm using in this presentation and research. I've also used a broad definition of reunion that includes one-off meetings and virtual contact or contact facilitated by social media and technology. And when I refer to social media, I'm referring to social networking sites like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, and I know there's a whole range of other ones as well, um, but for the participants in this study, Facebook was generally what they were talking about. Uh, technology refers to communication technologies like email, you know, our WhatsApp messaging platforms, video calling and online translation services. So participants in this study are using social media and technology in three ways. They're using it to search for birth family, to stay in contact with birth family and to engage with other adoptees and support groups. For the purpose of today's presentation, I am just going to speak about the themes related to searching and online contact with birth family. However, there are also findings relating to how participants use social media and technology to engage with support groups and to share their story, which I'm not going to speak to in today's presentation. So 11 of the 12 participants used social media and technology in their contact with birth family. Um, so really the findings that I'm gonna to speak to today are, are in relation to 11 participants. So these 11 participants were all in contact with birth siblings online. And seven were in contact with one or more, one or, one or two birth parents online, five with a birth mother, five with a birth father, and two with both birth, birth parents. Some participants are also in some online contact with members of their wider kinship networks. And the age range of participants was between 19 and 30 at the time of the interviews, which was just over two years ago. So onto the findings. Um, the findings I'm going to present today focus on themes identified using thematic analysis relating to searching and contact using social media and technology. As I said, this is ongoing doctoral work, so these findings are preliminary. As we go through the themes, I really want to center the voice of the participants. So I have populated the slides just with the quotes from participants, and I will speak around these. All of the participants' names have been changed to pseudonyms. So while the main focus of this study really was on the reunion experience, it is almost impossible to separate these out and all of the participants spoke about the search in their interviews. Most participants use social media or other platform, online platforms in some way in their search for their birth family. And as Eleanor explains here, so I sent him a friend request and he accepted straight away and messaged me being like, do I know you? And I was like, not yet, but I'm trying to find out, are you someone I should know? I explained my side of the story and he was like, he just responded, you're my sister. And I was like, this is unreal. So then he messaged our older sister and then she sent me a friend request, Eleanor. So as we can see here, Eleanor's contact with her birth family unfolded very quickly from sending a friend request, to having contact with two siblings, and also as a result, having access to information about her birth mother. For about half of the participants, they had enough information to search for and contact birth family members in the way Eleanor did. For others, maybe they didn't use directly use social media in their search, but once contact was established, they used social media and other online platforms to engage with their birth family online. One participant in this study used an online DNA database to get in contact with her birth family. And who knows, we did this research in another five or 10 years, maybe the numbers will be, will be much more that we're using online DNA um, searches. So it's evident from this that social media and technology is really facilitating, expediating and simplifying finding birth family members. And it has made it something that can be done remotely. This is particularly significant in the intercountry adoption context and for participants in this study for whom without social media and technology, searching for birth family would involve navigating systems and records in unfamiliar countries and languages and would involve significant travel expense and possibly challenges. 
Participants of all ages in this study really demonstrated taking control of their search. And while in most cases, adoptive parents were very supportive, it certainly was the adopted people who were driving the search and the contact. The speed and pace of contact using social media and technology. I just couldn't get over how fast. I was just like, this can't be happening like. I think that's all I kept saying for about three days straight, Margaret. As this quote demonstrates, the speed and pace of contact as a result of using social media and technology was really significant for participants. Margaret had a Skype call with her birth mother and three siblings within days of locating them online and other participants described similar experiences. Along with a platform for communications, the contact also provides a virtual window into each other's lives very, very quickly. And this is in stark contrast to what would have been previously recommended by social work practice, where a slower pace of contact was seen as crucial for the success of the contact. Sam does seem to feel that his contact moved a bit too fast in the beginning. So as Sam says, I kind of rushed into it a bit too much and I didn't get to maybe enjoy it as much because it was literally two weeks. And whereas if I was to know now what I knew then, I'd have waited another month or two months and just enjoy the kind of build up to it, Sam. So while Sam is clearly acknowledging that he did find it very fast, later in the interview, he also said that he didn't think anything would have slowed him down once he started the process. And this was similar for other participants too. While they acknowledged that everything happened quite fast, at the same time, they didn't feel that they could or would really have stopped or slowed the pace because there was such an intensity and I suppose an excitement about getting all that new information and a real sort of hunger for that information and contact at the beginning. Siblings became really, really important in terms of the online contact and participants seemed to have more involved online contact with their siblings in a way that they didn't have with their birth, um, birth parents. As Laura explains here, she posted my card to my family. And then I think one of my brothers, the oldest brother or the second oldest brother contacted on Facebook. So then that initiated my contact with them. I only have the contacts with the brothers through Facebook, but my parents, my mom and dad, they pop into the calls. So it's yeah. So they're always happy to pop into the calls for a few minutes. As this quote by Laura demonstrates, although she initiated contact with her parents using traditional methods of a letter, she was almost immediately switched onto an online platform. And we can see that her siblings are mediating the, facilitating the contact with her birth parents as they pop into the calls, as Laura puts it. So this participant and other participants certainly had more frequent and developed online contact with siblings um, than with their birth parents. And this may be partially due to digital literacy and language, but also seem to be due to some emotional factors, making contact with the birth parents more difficult. And I think Sarah really captures this in this quote. My mother, she'd end up crying the most time anyway. It would be the language barrier too, I think. At least with your siblings, you can chat about anything. Yeah, they don't have that kind of crying emotional thing either, I suppose just have the sibling emotions like I would, because I suppose they're not the, nothing to do with them, the situation. I think this quote demonstrates the complexity of the contact with birth parents. It doesn't seem to be evident in terms of the contact with siblings. And this is also seen in other kinds of, in other domestic adoption research around sibling reunions. An important theme in this study was the way that the online contact seemed to normalize the contact and participants seemed to develop what they described as very normal type relationships, particularly with their siblings. As Frankie describes here, so she's a call away like, I FaceTime her, I went to Germany recently and we rented a car, a super car, and we went out on the autobahn and I rang her out in the road. That was the last time I talked to her properly and that was only a few weeks ago, Frankie. And John also talks about sharing images through WhatsApp. We keep in contact through WhatsApp and we'd be sending, he'd be sending pictures where he'd be on holidays and I'd be sending pictures where I'd be on holidays. So all of the participants describe this kind of normalizing of the contact, particularly regarding their contact with siblings and social media and technology really seems to be facilitating this due to that ability to send photos and 
video calls at a low cost. And this often is a time used in place of words to communicate and keep in contact. And I'm sure we all do that where we send the photo or the, the quick video call to show people something. And this is particularly significant where participants don't share a language because it allows them to be together without speaking and yet it still creates what's kind of described often as mobile intimacy or connected presence in some of the migration literature. Boundaries are something that anyone who's been involved in adoption would be very familiar with. And participants in this study described constantly negotiating what feels right and comfortable for them and their birth family. And this appears to evolve and change. The nature of this contact means there's not usually any professional support or guidance, and there's no restriction on the content, on the contact. However, participants do say that the fact that the contact is occurring online and not in person does actually create a boundary and a distance that participants found helpful at times in terms of managing the contact. And some described it as uh, like a safe space. So finding the balance. I think the way that we're doing it now is sort of nice because you don't want to push them into something they're not comfortable with. I would like it, more contact. And the reality is I have to sort of keep it the way it is unless they want to do more of it. So I just let them do it. If they want to contact me, they can contact me. And if they don't, they don't. So as we can see from this quote from Owen, participants really were very aware of finding the correct balance in terms of the amount of contact. And he feels that this is important in terms of maintaining the relationship. And sometimes this meant allowing birth family to take the lead and maybe not having as much contact as he would have necessarily liked. Some also describe challenges and Emma describes in this quote below, finding the platform that her birth mother used to wish her happy birthday really inappropriate. My two older sisters, they called me for my birthday. Like my mom didn't even call me, you know. She just said, happy birthday. Just posted on my timeline, happy birthday, you know. I was just like, you know, it's just like, you know, I'm not really bothered or pushed. So Emma seems to have been quite hurt and offended that her birth mother had chosen to post on her timeline rather than picking up the phone and calling her. And I suppose this really evidences the real complexity of using these platforms that we're probably all finding and navigating. But when it's in a reunion relationship like this, obviously that complexity and challenge is added to. So managing unwanted or uncontrolled contact. So this is a common feature of virtual contact in general. And this was evident for participants in this study too. So Laura describes the experience of her birth family posting on her Facebook page. I don't know how to feel. It's like some part of me, it's happy too. But then again, like my Irish friends and stuff. Yeah, can see it. And it's just, they don't need to see that bit. Yeah, it's a bit more private, but no one has asked about it. So it's fine. So here, Laura is describing how her friends are seeing her Vietnamese birth family posting on her Facebook book and the types of questions that this could bring up for her. And she's aware that other people are seeing and witnessing this very private interaction and situation that has become public because it's happening and being played out through Facebook. So Emma manages this concern by having two Facebook pages. I have two Facebooks like one is in English and one is Romanian. That's the way I work it. So I try to keep my English speaking friends on one and my Romanian family and friends on the other. So there really was an awareness um, among participants that social media and technology maybe could leave them open to unwanted or uncontrolled contact and participants have developed different types of strategies for managing this. And I think Emma doesn't just do this because she doesn't want her birth family posting on her Facebook page, but she also talked about really wanting to protect them from seeing maybe what her life was like and her different living situation for them. So she was very aware of the difference in their standards of living and she, she talked more about it in terms of this. This kind of ties into this, this theme as well around financial expectations. So this was certainly a challenge for people in terms of managing the boundaries and participants were doing different things to try to manage this. As we can see from Owen's quote below. Yeah, just have a very plain background and try not to show them something that you know would sort of make them feel sad or angry jealous you know but then again the younger ones are very curious 
He wanted to see my house. He wanted to see where I lived. And he was the one who asked. So I said, okay. And then he sort of like, he was shocked when he had seen it. Because like, compare, like there's nothing like what we would live in would be in Guatemala. So we can see that Owen was trying to protect his siblings from seeing his house and his background, but they wanted to see it. And this really became quite a challenging experience. Sam also had the experience of being put under pressure financially and asked for money by his brother. And he tried to manage that as well, as he explains in this quote. More so from my brother, because he's like, now that dad's gone, we both have to work harder to support my mother. Yeah, we had one slight argument over an issue related to sending money over. And I was looking up kind of how to respond to that. And the thing was to like kind of stand your ground and say, look, I am the older brother, so technically I'm still the boss. So once I kind of replied that, his attitude totally changed, I guess. This also seemed to be quite a gendered expectation in terms of Sam's responsibility as a brother or a son. Sam also has a sister who was adopted, who was in contact with, his, with, with their birth family, and she isn't experiencing these types of requests. So, Participants were using a variety of technologies concurrently at times and often using online translation tools to help with this. So as Margaret explains here, like the language barrier, so we always just talk through Facebook Messenger or WhatsApp. I'd be lost without Google Translate. Then like obviously sending photos, videos, like they've been showing me their town, their area and stuff, and I've been doing the same for them. And Eleanor talks really about not trusting the translation tools and almost um, sort of back checking, back checking them for accuracy and finding that it really didn't come up with the same thing. And this was really frustrating for her because she felt that maybe she wasn't being fully understood or her message wasn't being fully um, portrayed. Being together in person, it's a completely different thing. So while the narratives of all the participants demonstrate um, that virtual communication was hugely benefit, beneficial for them, they were really, really very clear that it was not the same as meeting in real life. And I suppose we can probably all identify with some of this given our own experiences in the last, uh, the last couple of years. So as Frankie describes, when I met my sister first, it was through Skype, but it's a completely different thing when they're tangible and they're in the room and it's not a digital screen. The only way you can actually say that it's true is by touching Touching the person, like physically grabbing their arm or their hand, and just figuring out, are they, is this real or not? And Sam likens the experience of talking to somebody on a dating app. It's almost like talking to someone on Tinder or something and getting to know them, but until you actually meet them, you can't make that next step forward. You know, so it kind of feels a bit like that. And I suppose Laura emphasizes just the importance again of the touch. So to be able to hug them and stuff would be great. Yeah, give them a bit of a high five sometimes. So this corresponds with some of the migration literature as well, which suggests really that the connected presence and the mobile intimacy, which is achieved due to social media and technology, it doesn't necessarily compensate for physical proximity and intimacy. This was definitely the case for participants in this study also. So um, some of my and of the implications, I suppose, are some of my preliminary conclusions. Um, so the study really demonstrates the central role that social media and technology is now playing in reunion in intercountry adoption. And this concurs with some of the existing literature as well. Participants described mainly positive feelings regarding their use of social media and technology in birth family contact and concluded that the benefits definitely outweigh the risks and challenges. And this is in contrast to studies which have emphasized the challenges and risks to emotional well-being of using social media in this type of context. However, I do think it's important to say that a lot of those studies were looking at adoptions from care or from the perspective of parents of children. And this study, I think as far as I know, is the first to, to explore it from the perspective of adult intercountry adoptees. So boundary issues that we have seen were definitely evident for participants. Um, but as I mentioned, participants really felt that using social media and technology um, allowed them to slow down the pace as well and to, to get to know one another in a safe space. And 
felt really that the risks certainly outweighed, or that the benefits certainly outweighed the, the risks. It seems clear that the way reunion is happening in international adoption is really very different from previous practice in domestic adoption. Participants are meeting multiple members of birth family concurrently via Skype or other communication platforms very quickly with little or no input from professionals. And we can see that the participants are really uh, demonstrating agency and taking control of their search um, and taking control of their contact with their birth families. Uh, and while, as I said, they definitely had support of adoptive parents, um, really the, the adoptees were absolutely in the driving seat in terms of it. Um, the participants in this study um, really had no engagement with social work or really any, any type of professional support in terms of the contact. Um, and it seems that social media and technology helped participants to normalize their contact with their birth family and particularly, I suppose, with their siblings. Um, and the particular significance of contact with birth siblings was very evident in this study. And this is consistent with the existing reunion and sibling, sibling reunion in the, adopt, in the domestic adoption context. However, as was maybe what was new in this study was that birth siblings are also mediating, facilitating the online contact between their birth parents and the adoptee. And this can be by setting up calls or supporting par parents to share photos, or as Laura puts it, to pop in, to support her parents to pop into the calls. So the contact um, using social media and technology certainly seems to answer some of those who am I questions that participants spoke about having at the beginning of their searches. And participants can be seen to really be act actively constructing their own identities from the information and the knowledge and the experience that they're having online with their birth families. Participants were really very clear that despite the benefits of virtual communication, it's not the same as meeting in real life. And this corresponds, as I said, with the, the, the migration literature. And finally, an implication of this study is that social workers and adoption practitioners are often practicing within this changed landscape with really little or no training or guidance in relation to social media and technology. And this study suggests that online contact will continue to play a significant role in contact with birth family in international adoption, but presumably in domestic adoption also. And this is something people involved in adoption Need to be aware of in terms of supporting people who are adopted, their birth parents and adoptive parents and others that are involved. I think it's just important to say that the findings that I've presented today have focused on the virtual contact and the other part of this study does explore the in-person contact and really the contact with birth parents seem to be much more developed in the in-person contact in a way that it wasn't in participants reporting of their use of social media and the online context. Sorry, lost my screen. Sorry. It was going so well to the last slide. <laughs> uh, anyway, the last slide just says thank you. So um, thanks to everybody for, for listening. I really appreciate it. Um, I do have um, some of the findings published uh, in a British Journal of Social Work article. And if anyone is interested in that, uh, please feel free to get in touch with me and I can send you the link. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Let's give her a virtual hand here. <laughs> I think that was so interesting. So really such fascinating work. I really appreciate it. And so timely, you know, because we're all like right here, we're all in this new world of social media and online technology mediated communication. And um, there's a lot uh, of advantages, but there's also a lot we need to learn. So um, if people would like to, if you do uh, like want to request um, something from Anne-Marie, you could go ahead and put it in the chat and we will preserve the chat um, before we get off so that we'll have like any information that you want. And maybe we can also just send people a follow-up with um, you know your contact information and so on. We can certainly do that as well as with the link to um, our YouTube place where this will be posted. So the good news is that now we have about 15 or 20 minutes for discussion. And I think there's a, a lot to discuss. So if you would have a question or a comment, 
uh, if you look down on the bottom, at least on my laptop, it's on the bottom right where it says reactions. You can uh, touch reactions and one of the choices will be raise hand. So I will, so Anne Marie is gonna call on people, but we'll help if need be, so. Thanks, Al. Uh, Jesus, I think you're first with the hand up. Your, your microphone is, is muted. Uh. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. Yes, well, I was saying thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, wonderful presentation. and uh, Very interesting. I think it goes very well with the current um, um, line of studies with the life or the lived experience of adoption. Uh, so giving the voice to adoptees, I think it's, uh, it's very important and listening to their stories and, and their experiences. And this is, this is what you're doing. So uh, I think it's a, it's a wonderful uh, way to approach um, the topic of search and reunion and, and doing it in inter-country adoption, which is a kind of an exceptional circumstance for a reunion and, 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 and uh, search and reunion and conversations and all that, it's, it makes it very interesting. Um, long ago, before the social media and the technology were with us, we did a study uh, using domestic adoption in that case uh, about search and reunion. And we found something very similar to what you were describing. Siblings were the the main target of the attempts to, to find members of the birth family. And uh, mothers were, and, and fathers were uh, more rarely present. One of our findings was that fathers were almost totally absent. Now you told that you, um, in your sample, three of your subjects had contacts with their fathers. However, I didn't see anything regarding the fathers in your descriptions. Can you tell us something about that? Yeah, um, thanks, um, Jesus. I mean, I suppose I have indicated that people have contact if they have any type of contact online and definitely the, the level of contact um, was a lot less. And it was, I mean, like as we saw in Laura's quote, you know, her birth father was popping into the back of the call. So that, that's what that contact looked like in, in her case. Um, so yeah, it certainly was very limited as well in this study, even though um, I suppose, you know, I have I have recorded it as that they had contact, if they had any sort of contact online with them, but um, where birth parents were together, uh, I think really it was birth mothers that were yeah, at the forefront of that, but the birth father was also there, I suppose, but maybe not really necessarily engaging hugely in it. Um, and then where they were, where they were separate, um, often it was the, the maybe the, the siblings that were kind of helping to manage that. So they were maybe seeing their birth father online. I, you know, it was more probably the visual that, than, than much else. There wasn't a whole lot of, of communication. So yeah, probably a similar, similar finding really when you, when you dig a bit deeper than just the number, yeah. If I, if I could just add a quick uh, comment onto Jesus's question uh, about the more, you know, the what's happening, the trend in terms of uh, young adult adoptees themselves taking more control over this. I'd like to mention to people that there is a, an, a, a website called imadopted.org that is managed by Al Alex Gilbert. And Alex was adopted from Russia uh, to New Zealand. And he has had a reunion with his birth parents. He's traveled all over Russia. He's learning Russian. But now he is actually interviewing young adult adoptees all over the world who have, who either have or want to have this kind of contact. So uh, I saw a post on Facebook recently that he is uh, creating, I, it looks like kind of a video podcast or like a TV show or something. But anyway, he's very engaged. So that's another good resource, imadopted.org. Thanks, Kyle, yes. Uh, Steve, I think uh, you're next. 
Yeah, hey, uh, Anne Marie, wonderful, wonderful presentation, really fantastic research, wonderful subject. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. I'm I am curious, um, what role or yeah, what role do post-adoption social workers or su you know, professional support professional support for adoptees as as they navigate these searches and these reunions online? What, what role is there for the social worker um, to, su to support the adoptee? Uh, what, what did you hear from your participants and kind of what, what are your thoughts based on the research? Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, I mean, really, I can say very, very little about it because participants really didn't, um, didn't indicate that they had engaged in, in that in any way. Um, and I think for participants in Ireland, they, most of this group really are the early intercountry adoptees to Ireland. And where there was, um, if there was an agency in Ireland at the time, which I think for most of these, that's not how the adoption would have happened. Um, it didn't really even occur to participants to sort of go back to, you know, their original agency or, or where they had been adopted from. That wasn't kind of in any way what participants did. Um, in terms of like kind of accessing social work support, again, really there, there isn't really a place um, uh, where adoptees could have, could have went to. I mean, some of them do access Bernardo's in Ireland, which provide an excellent social work support or an excellent support um, service for adoptees, but it's not really in connection to their search necessarily. So they don't help them in terms of navigating their search or any of that. So really um, adoptees really were managing this very much on their own. And that is the finding rather than kind of how they engage with social work because they didn't, they really, didn't talk about that or they didn't engage with or they didn't even they weren't even aware that they could it really wasn't even on their radar that they would have went back to an agency or anything like that so really where they did engage support it would have been maybe maybe a translator in the birth country or maybe um like a a kind of an interested party who, who would offer to help with the search so that type of support was was happening um, now in saying that almost all of the participants did talk about having attended counseling at some stage in their in their lives you know separately as well so not necessarily maybe that they wouldn't have liked the support but it just wasn't it didn't seem to be an option for them I think maybe for the younger international adoptees um it might be different now you know so maybe the, the next group to come up you know there's probably a clear agency that they could go back to um in saying that, that really is a, an agency that deals with adoptions. I'm not sure how much of their remit is to deal with post-adoption support. So it's it's a gap in our in Ireland, certainly. It's a gap in the services. Yeah. Uh, Julie? Yeah, it is Julie. Um, great job, uh, Anne-Marie, on your presentation. My question is, how did you decide on which demographic of adoptees you wanted to use um, in your research, I think I saw Guatemala, Vietnam, Russia, Colombia, and maybe one more, if I'm uh, forgetting. Romania. But yeah, yeah. And so I'm just curious how you um, decided to choose those uh, group. Um, yeah, I suppose, uh, Jolie, I, I left it open really to, to intercountry adoptees in Ireland. Um, I wasn't specific on the country of, uh, the country of birth. Um, so they were the participants that I managed to recruit. As I mentioned, recruitment was challenging for me. Um, I think really adoptees in Ireland are just coming to the age where they're starting to search. And I suppose the cohort, um, uh, five of the participants are from Romania, and that's not surprising because um, that would have they would have been a, a large number of adoptees who came to Ireland. So I left it very open. Um, I really wanted to generally explore the experience of, of intercountry adoptees in Ireland. So I wasn't specific um, to a country group. I mean, I think it would be interesting probably to look at one, you know, look at specific countries, uh, maybe down the road, maybe when more adoptees have done this. Um, we don't have any statistics or information about how many adoptees have searched for their birth families um, who were adopted internationally to Ireland. But 
certainly from the perspective of recruitment, it was quite challenging to, to recruit people. So um, I'm not sure really what the numbers are like, uh, but it would be interesting to look at kind of specific countries and see what the experience is like in different countries, definitely, yeah. Thanks, Julie. Um, I think, uh, Hal, did you want to? Yeah, just a, a quick question. I wonder if you, I know you've already published some of your findings and so some of it is, and you've spoken at conferences and things like that. Are you aware of any impact or the impact that your findings have had on other young adults who may not have thought about searching or I mean, is there, do you think this is going to kind of stimulate interest in doing that or kind of stimulate people to thinking more about sibling? Because I, I don't know if they would initially be inclined to think about contacting siblings, but what I, I guess I'm asking, what kind of impact do you think your findings will have on um, this going forward? Yeah, I mean, I suppose this is such a, a unique experience for everyone. So, I mean, you can't ever provide a blueprint as such, but I hope that I think that it might be something that people could use before maybe they, they get involved in, a, in searching to have some sense of what it might look like or what the outcomes might be like. And I mean, at the moment, it has only been published in a, an academic journal and I'm aware that's not particularly accessible for, for most people. But, um, you know, when I get this PhD finished and, uh, you know, I would hope to, to kind of uh, publish it in a more sort of user friendly um, format or share it um you know i mean i have sh i have shared it with um adoption professionals but we really, really share it more widely and and try to make it more accessible yeah it has also been shared with the there is a i have actually written a um a practice paper as well for the irish association of social workers so um maybe some of hopefully some of those have read that that was in the the irish association of social work journals so hopefully in that way it is it is maybe having some some impact as well um, I think Ellen, sorry, uh, Ellen, yeah. yeah. Hi, Ellen. Hi, I really enjoy your presentation. Thank you so much. And it makes me want to travel to Ireland. Your, your photographs are beautiful. Um, so I have, I have a question. Um, I love how organic this um, search through social media happens so that the adoptees can kind of create their own path um take control in the driver's seat i love all of that um i wonder as they're not really facilitated by anybody else but other adoptees such as the i'm adopted.org organizations things like that i wonder if these social media sites should be a little bit um more conscious about safety -ness. um when you go on uh, uh dna sites you know, should there be some kind of warning or some kind of explanation that, you know, this is the Pandora's box that people are, that are, that are heading into. And I love the fact that one of your adoptees figured out you could have two Facebook sites. I didn't know you could. And so that's just a smart, organic way of solving kind of the safetyness of the, of the approach. Yeah. And I think people, you know, lots of the participants are showing really, um, a lot of um, yeah, being very sort of smart and informed around how they manage that and really actually being very, very thoughtful about it. But, um, but yeah, of course you are opening, um, you know, you don't know what you're opening I suppose when you start there and, and people are definitely going into really unsupported. So um, it seemed to be okay for the participants in this study. They seem to manage it, it, it pretty well. Um, not that all of the outcomes were perfect, but they, they were able to manage it. But I, I can see how people might need more support, definitely, yeah. Thank you. Um, I think, uh, Jesus, I think you were next. Oh, a very quick question. I can't remember the age range of your sample, but I, I think I can remember there was one subject who was maybe 18 or 19, and then the oldest one was 30 uh, something. My question, yeah. 
my question is about the age when they uh, tend to start or to, to be more active in this search and reunion thing. So do you have any sense of that? Do, do they tend to start early or, or late in this, in this transition? Yeah, I mean, I suppose it's, it's such a small study. It's hard to obviously generalize, you know, with, with just 12 participants. Um, and I think it ranged. I mean, one of the participants did make contact with his birth family when he was 12, but the rest were all, um, I mean, I think that the lady who was 19, she made contact at about 17. And then the others really were all in their mid twenties, which is sort of similar to maybe what we would know from, from domestic adoption research as well. Um, but, uh, you know, I can't, you can't, of course, uh, it's, it's too small a sample to, but that's my sense just from the, the small group, yeah. Uh, Julie. I can, hello, I can add to that. I've sent you a direct message. So I've written about adoption and I'm an adopter. And uh, so I spend a lot of time with the doctors and I've got friends who are older and it tends to be puberty is the kickoff point. My son is about to reach that point and it's all the questions are starting. So puberty and about an identity, that tends to be the main trigger when people kind of, you look around, think actually, I don't look like my family members. My friends look like their family members. I don't. And that's when, that, that's when the curiosity starts. Often it's on impulse that they decide to suddenly decide to search. They might've had a bad day at school, bad day at home. I think, you know what? I want to find my real family. And suddenly they instigate the search. And suddenly they get the, even when they're like, you know, they're like 19, 20, they're not expecting a response to come back. And in terms of social work, post-adoption support, in terms of supporting young people in the UK, it's very, very poor. It's a very, very poor service. It's very, very underfunded. So when, so when you hit crisis point and you want help, there is nobody to help because they just, don't, they just don't have the resources. So that's, that answers some of the kind of questions yeah. that you might have read. But I sent you a direct message as well. Thanks, uh, Julie. Yeah, I think I, I think I have, I, if you're the same person, I think I do have, I have read your work and your reference to them in the, in the <laughs> Yes, thank you very much. You're just checking. <laughs> but thank but you if you need a copy for... of it, I can email it you. That would be great. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I think, oh yeah, I think this is probably our last question. Uh, so um, is it Pam? Pammy, thank you. Um, yes, I love your presentation. Thank you for all your hard work on it. Um, I'm just curious, with the 12 that you worked with, um, will there be any follow-up in the future with them or are they able to reach out to you if they had something they wanted to talk about or is something changed? I was just curious what the direction for them uh, was given. Yeah, I mean, I suppose in terms of the the research and the interviews they were they were really they were kind of one-off interviews now I did do two interviews with one participant because she was just in online contact and was going to visit her birth family so I interviewed her again when she had come back from that visit um and certainly obviously I would share all of the findings um with her but um but it is a sort of a standalone piece of research for now anyway yeah but it would be very interesting to follow them Well, our time is at a close, but I want to thank everyone for coming again. This has been a fascinating session, and let's give Emery a round of applause. <laughs> so again, it's been such a pleasure to have Anne Marie here through the Fulbright program. It's been a great, she's here um, till the end of January, so we have a lot more talking and discussing to be doing and everything, so that's a wonderful opportunity as well. Um, I also wanted to mention that uh, uh, that Anne Marie did attend our Summer Adoption Research Institute in 2019. We are hoping to do that again in the spring of 2022 in May, and it will be in person here on the UMass Amherst campus. It's a week long opportunity for a small group of graduate students and recent PhDs to really immerse themselves with a group of faculty in um, research techniques and theories and concepts that will really help launch them as adoption researchers. So we have an announcement about it on our Facebook page, uh, on our Facebook page and on our website and uh, applications are actually open already. So if you 
find that you're in that situation and you're interested, or if you know of someone else who might be interested, please, um, please share the word. Thanks again, Anne-Marie, and thank you all for coming. Have a wonderful holiday season and hope to see you again. Thank you.